Uh, this panel is going to talk about U.S. policy toward the South China Sea. We have experts from several different countries, and so it should be uh, an uh, interesting discussion. Uh, the first panelist is our colleague from CSIS, Bonnie Glazer, who's a senior advisor for Asia and the Freeman Chair in Asia Studies. Bonnie? Good morning. Um, this is a short panel, uh, and we've only been given 10 minutes, so uh, all of what I'll be saying today will obviously be brief. Uh, but if you are interested in reading more of the details, you can uh, read my, my paper, which is assen essentially not so much about U.S. policy as it is U.S. strategy. Um, I think we've heard quite a bit about um, uh, U.S. policy this morning and, ye and yesterday. I think what the United States is trying to do is to lower tensions uh, over these territorial disputes and create an environment in which the disputes can be managed uh, peacefully and potentially uh, be resolved um, over the course uh, of time. Increasingly, uh, there is concern about Chinese behavior. Uh, which is seen as undermining these objectives. And so I see the United States as designing a strategy that is uh, seeking to change China's cost-benefit uh, calculus, basically to persuade uh, Beijing that using intimidation and coercion against its neighbors um, has a very high cost. This is not an easy thing to do, um, and it remains to be seen whether the United States is going to be successful. Uh, but what I have done uh, in, my, in my papers essentially outline um, uh, several components of this strategy, and I will just go into a few uh, of the elements that I think are um, especially notable. Um, first, I would begin with a change in rhetoric, which we have seen from the United States uh, this year. Uh, much more uh, clearly calling out China for its behavior. Uh, I would really trace this to uh, even after the implementation of the ADIZ in the East China Sea last November. Uh, but you can see this quite clearly in the uh, Assistant Secretary Danny Russell's uh, testimony that he gave in February in which he voiced firm opposition to the use of in intimidation, coercion, or force uh, to assert a, ter a territorial claim. Um, and then we saw more recently, again, in uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Russell's remarks uh, to Congress in, uh, on U.S.-China relations, uh, where he maintained that China's actions are raising tensions and damaging China's international standing, and talked about uh, the uh, nine-dash line being inconsistent with international law. So we increasingly uh, are hearing some uh, sharp uh, remarks uh, pointing a finger more so than in the past um, at uh, Chinese behavior. The second element that I want to highlight is the U.S. effort to mobilize support for the right of nations to use international legal dispute mechanisms that we've been hearing about, as the Philippines has um, with this recent case. So not only has the United States itself not taken side, but strongly endorsed the right of Manila to uh, avail itself of uh, the, the uh, mechanisms that exist under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. But the United States has encouraged other countries to do that as well. So you can see uh, when President Obama was in uh, Malaysia, uh, the, in the joint statement that was signed, uh, there was an endorsement of uh, countries' rights to use international arbitration. Uh, at the Shangri-La Dialogue, there was a trilateral statement signed by the U.S., Japan, and Australia. Um, also, first, actually the first time that Australia, in writing, had endorsed uh, the right of nations to use international arbitration. The G7 leader statement is yet another example. Um, Japan and Germany have separately uh, supported the Philippines' uh, right uh, to launch this, uh, this case, um, as well as the European Parliament. A third element is uh, bolstering U.S. military presence and capabilities in the region, um, and uh, there's obviously a great deal the U.S. has been doing. Uh, now the uh, signing of the 10-year Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement with the Philippines, there are steps the U.S. is taking unilaterally to bolster its presence 
Um, but one thing that is really worth highlighting here is the growing willingness of the U.S. to deploy some assets um, when uh, tensions rise over a specific area. So we saw in the case of the second Thomas Shoal, uh, where the, there was a, uh, a Navy uh, um, PA uh, Poseidon surveillance air aircraft that was uh, deployed. And then recently in the case of the uh, Chinese oil rig deployed off the Paracels, uh, there are also, there's also evidence that the U.S. was flying um, uh, P-3 surveillance aircraft. So I think this is signaling U.S. desire to have a peaceful resolution of uh, disputes and to try to uh, deter coercion. A fourth element is supporting um, enhancing defensive capabilities of allies and partners. We've, this is mostly uh, the Philippines and Vietnam, um, and I think we've heard a good deal about uh, this yesterday. Uh, U.S. maritime security assistance to Southeast Asia overall will exceed $156 million in the 2014-2015 timeframe. Um, and Secretary of Defense Hagel uh, talked about this uh, at length in his speech to the Shangri-La Dialogue. Uh, a fifth element is backing multilateral frameworks uh, for cooperation, risk reduction, and dispute resolution, the code of conduct, of course, um, being a central part of that. Encouraging Southeast Asian claimants to work together is also, a, I think, an increasingly important element of this strategy. So to the extent that the Philippines, Vietnam, and Malaysia, which have already gotten together once um, and may get together again to coordinate some of their actions, this is something that is seen by the United States um, as helpful. Uh, the U.S. is also, of course, supporting models of management of disputes, such as the decision by Indonesia and the Philippines to delimitate their um, exclusive economic zone, and that just took place recently. So promoting examples of good behavior, manage, good management, or even resolutions of disputes. And then, as we heard from uh, Michael Fuchs this morning, the Deputy Assistant Secretary. This is, I see, is increasingly a new component of this U.S. strategy, putting forward very specific suggestions of um, confidence building measures or conflict avoidance measures. And this uh, idea of freezing construction for having all the states identify what are the provocations that they don't want to be um, taken against them and put together a list and then all agree on them. This is essentially, I think, what Danny Russell described when he was at the ASEAN senior officials meeting um, in uh, Yangon. Uh, this is something that I think is an outgrowth of growing U.S. frustration about the slow pace of China ASEAN discussions over uh, the code of conduct. So what we see is the U.S. taking a mo more proactive role, putting forward proposals, even though I know that Danny Russell called it informal. Um, it's not an official proposal. And of course, uh, the United States is not a party to this dispute, but we are looking, I think, to put to forward ideas um, that uh, might um, uh, be helpful in uh, lower intentions. Um, so there are a few others um, that I uh, will not go into uh, because of time, but I will uh, close by saying that uh, U.S. strategy uh, towards the South China Sea and managing these disputes is continuing to evolve um, in response to rising tensions um, in these territorial disputes, and particularly, as I mentioned, what is seen as um, unhelpful and destabilizing Chinese actions. Uh, the key, the real goal of the strategy is to persuade China that um, it's the salami slicing tactics, it's intimidation against its neighbors, its efforts to change the status quo in the South China Sea in its, in its favor, um, are really counterproductive and self-defeating. Um, and that they really don't serve Chinese interests uh, over the long run. Uh, the U.S. is seeking to shape China's policy choices by increasing the cost to Beijing uh, of using coercion against its neighbors and potentially even flouting international law. Um, what are the possible costs for China? Um, they include deteriorating relations um, with its neighbors, uh, a tarnished image um, as a nation that violates international law, um, uh, closer ties, including, of course, military cooperation between the United States and China's neighbors, um, and increased uh, U.S. diplomatic, military, and security involvement in the South China Sea dispute, which I think that the U.S. Uh, hopes, uh, uh, which, which China hopes to not see. 
Um, nevertheless, changing Beijing's calculus uh, of the cost and benefits uh, of its strategy to advance its interest in the South China Sea um, is not going to be easy. Um, asserting Chinese claims, I think, um, is very, very popular domestically in China. And uh, it, is, it is bolstering Chinese Communist Party legitimacy. So as my Chinese friends tell me, it may not be uh, supported outside of Chinese borders, but it's very much supported by the Chinese people. Um, there is a narrative in China that, uh, that uh, all other claimants have advanced their interests, they're all drilling for oil, and China um, is the country that was uh, moderate, conciliatory, tried to shelve disputes and promote joint development while everybody else took advantage of, uh, of that um, moderation. Uh, Xi Jinping, I think, places great emphasis on building China's maritime power. We heard this uh, discussed uh, yesterday, and he has repeatedly said that he will not compromise or make concessions on disputes over sovereignty and territorial integrity. And I think that the Chinese are betting that U.S. willingness to intervene in South China Sea territorial disputes will be limited and that their neighbors will eventually accommodate uh, to Chinese interests. So this is a strategy that the U.S. is, is pursuing that um, is not going to certainly see results overnight. It's going to take some time, and it, the jury is still out as to whether or not uh, it will be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Our next speaker is Dr. Chu Shu Long, who is a professor of political science and international relations at the School of Public Policy and Management at Tsinghua University. He's also the deputy director of the Institute of International Strategic Development Studies at the same school. Professor. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, my topic is also given to uh, talking about the Chinese will, uh, about the U.S. Uh, policy in South China Sea. Uh, certainly, I should see there are a lot of Chinese wills uh, because there are a lot of people in China. Uh, but uh, I try to uh, to see the. Uh, mainstream view, official view, and the mainstream academic uh, view. And the, we see that the U.S. Uh, policy or strategy or position on China, South China Sea uh, is not limited to South China Sea issue. It's coming from a larger strategic thinking. Uh, certainly big country uh, action is from strategic framework. And uh, we see that the uh, U.S. Uh, strategy uh, in South China Sea has a lot to do with the uh, rebalancing strategy uh, since 2010. And, uh, and we see the culture of uh, effective relation of the South China Sea situation and the U.S. pivot strategy has been a driving force. Uh, and in other words, uh, U.S. has caused the tensions higher growing in China Sea in recent years, intentionally or not intentionally. Uh, the single fact that is tensions over South China Sea certainly become much higher in the last three or four years since U.S. adopted pivot strategy. Specifically, since Secretary Clinton's Hanoi speech July 10, 2010, like cause. Uh, so a lot of Chinese see that the U.S. intended to trick, to trigger troubles in South China Sea by the like, period strategy. And the bigger background of this led, led uh, I have with Bonnie Glees and others, I have working uh, to understand U.S. foreign policy for three decades. So I always try to compare this administration Asian policy with the previous Democratic administration, Bill Clinton, President Clinton. I remember well that the time, which is 30 or 40 years ago, American Asian uh, strategy based on three periods, economic interests, uh, democratic human rights, and uh, security. But uh, from period of strategy of the last couple of years, we hear too much talking about security. We don't hear too much talking about the democratic human rights in Asia. 
or economic development cooperation. Uh, TPP is just the two years new, and there was, a, a, to my uh, observation, there has been little progress. So U.S. rebalancing strategy in Asia Pacific in the last three, four years, focusing too much, heavily dependent on security issues, or in other words, dependent on the troubles, problems, disputes among Asian countries. And, the, uh, and we see that the U.S. Uh, used that to maintain its leading or do dominated role in Asia, to maintain its alliance. So this is intentionally strategic to uh, increase tensions, to trigger tensions in South China Sea. So U.S. is behind uh, this, those disputes. It's intended to do it. Second, the Chinese uh, view that the U.S. Uh, strategy in South China Sea is imbalanced. Uh, imbalanced uh, is not reasonable. It's not a subject objective, and uh, it's of great bias. The reason we said that is that we hear this two days. Uh, I did not hear yesterday today like any American officials, as we hear, say anything wrong over other countries. We hear all the days, two days, everything wrong is by Chinese. So there's only by the guy in Asia, that is China. Every other uh, are good guys. Uh, so this has been a uh, uh, year's practice American Asian policy, including South China Sea uh, policy that when any others did something wrong, or Philippines sent the largest uh, military ships to Hawaiian Island uh, April 2012, and U.S. kept the silence. Or uh, Vietnam passed a uni uni unilateral law, uh, changed the uh, uh, status quo, or any others, uh, we did not hear American government say anything or the constructions by others on the rocks, reefs, uh, controlled by the Vietnam or by Malaysia, by the Philippines, uh, we, did, we do not see pictures so here. Only picture we saw like construction are Chinese. We never see here or in the US like the constructions by others. So this is a great bias, unreasonable, unfair uh, treatment. Uh, that China cannot accept. Uh, and here there are a lot of talking about international law. Yes, uh, as a, a professor of political science, I must say China is still far away from a lot of country, uh, both internal and external. So China should make a greater effort. But I also think U.S. is now is in no position to talking about international law. It's not in position to lecture others because U.S. has not the participant a lot of international law. We said about the like, uh, CDPT treaty, not approved that. We said about international crime court, U.S. is not part of that. We talk about the UNC convention or even some human rights international convention. U.S. is not a part of that. So U.S. is just talking about the international law uh, to require others when it's needed and feel free uh, when it does not need international law for itself, including Iraq war. And uh, Bonnie uh, talked a lot about uh, against the opposing Chinese using force or coercion but I think the U.S. did the most, including yesterday afternoon talking and uh, Minister Gopani talking about U.S. Uh, going to deploy, already deployed a greater military force in China Sea to threaten China. Uh, so what, what, we, what we should call this? It's also a use of force, threat to use of force. It's also coercion. Uh, so, and the, 
in the past 20 years, I should say, that the U.S. is the country U.S. military make most of the war in the world. Uh, I think U.S. use most of the coercion in the world, including Iraq, uh, including a lot of other countries. Uh, last point, uh, I think a part of as an uh, observer, I think a part of the U.S. Uh, strategy, Bonnie calls use the term on South China Sea, or uh, whole Asia, or about China, is based on the misassessment about China and about Xi Jinping himself. We hear the talking yesterday, today. And uh, I think now it's a problem for Americans, officials, and uh, ex academics to say that China is increasingly become assertive, uh, provocative, aggressive, and because of rising China, uh, including rising Chinese military power spending on marine time strategy to become a marine time power. Uh, uh, I think China is rising, uh, there's no doubt. And China has become a bigger marine time power because China is also a marine time country, right? China is not just a continental country. Uh, but uh, I'll carefully follow every speech that the President Xi Jinping gave me since he took power as a top leader of China. Uh, I found that there is nothing major new from his internal and external policies in the past half uh, and one year, one year and a half. Uh, it's basically the continuation of uh, previous leadership of uh, 18 party Congress, 70 party Congress, uh, those uh, uh, policy lines, strategic line. And the, uh, I think only new, something major new from him is anti-corruption efforts in China. Economic reform, external policy, are basically continuation. I think this is a matter of assessment, a matter of observation or study. Uh, as a scholar in China, watching Chinese politics from policy and reading seven Chinese newspapers every day in 20 years, I did not find uh, many things new from Xi Jinping, uh, from that leadership. Uh, so I think this uh, overstatement, exaggeration uh, in the US, both in government and academic uh, circle about the assessment of our Chinese trends, Chinese intention. That's the reason Xi Jinping last week and uh, met with uh, Secretary Kerry and uh, Secretary Rook, emphasized that the understanding each other between U.S. and China uh, is very much fundamental to have an uh, objective, real understanding. Uh, certainly, there are a lot of misunderstanding in China about U.S. internal and external policy. But uh, here, from these days, last than today, and from reading uh, Americans' speech, newspapers, I see there are strong uh, exaggeration about the China that we do not see, like the kind of China inside the China. Uh, and this is partly, I should say, as my last words, I used to talk with the Brookings friends, Brookings friends nearby and others. This is very much because that like, most Americans even American experts on Chinese studies use little Chinese to read the Chinese, to understand the Chinese. You basically use English. I'm a thought about that. Just as in China, how Chinese can really understand American society, people, culture, history, politics without using English, just using Chinese. So I think this is a, the, the, one of the source of mis misunderstanding, exaggeration, bias, and others, in yeah, attention to political interests uh, from policy interests.
and needs to advocate. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Professor Chushu Long. Our next speaker is uh, Vice Admiral Yoji Koda. He's a uh, retired Vice Admiral from the uh, Japan Maritime Self-Defense Forces. Vice Admiral. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm not a professor. I'm not a PhD holder. I was just a lazy, sloppy sailor. <laughs> so what I'm going to tell you now is you know, just the simple sailor's view on South China Sea. But the important thing is many of you overlooked my point. So this is a kind of the indication and warning to you, especially the leadership in Washington, D.C. You are familiar with, so okay, this is the, the, the real complication of the South China Sea. Yeah. And just the quick history, the northern part, you know, the parcels, the medium-sized skirmish in 1974. Since then, China has been exercising its practical control over the islands. Sorry for Vietnamese, but this is the reality. And the southern part, Spratlys, before 1988, China has no footprint. But one day skirmish in 1988, China started spreading its footprint. This is the reality, or at least what we understand. So the point is 1988, okay? And then, since the China exercises the northern part of, as a, its pra practical control, I'd like to focus mainly on the southern part. Spread these, okay? There are about 40 islands to rocks and sea mountains. And among them, only 13 is good for human activities. How many? Okay. Six belongs to the Philippines, five belongs to Vietnamese, Taiwan one, and uh, Malaysia one. Okay. The circled, circled island is the larger one, larger than four football fields. Those are the only 13 islands in the area. And China exercises no practical control over all 13, okay? And this is a breakdown. China claims all the islands, except one Vietnamese claims 12. And this is the complication. And four of them, there are s small airstrips, spread lease under Vietnam, five meters, and Thich Island and the Philippines, they are pretty long, 1,800 meters. And E2 Aba under Taiwan, 1,200 meters. And there's Swarl Islands, about 1,300 meters. These are the real strategic spot in the southern part. Please remember this. Okay. And one more. In the northern part, or the, we, what we call the eastern approach of the South China Sea, closer to Bashi, and Luzon Strait. There are Taiwanese-controlled Platas Islands. And there are three larger reefs, but only one re larger le leaf under Taiwanese control, that's the Platas Islands. And there are about 1,500 meters, meters runway. So those are the five larger islands with airstrips for good for military use. So in my definition, these are the strategic strongholds and which China does not have any practical control. Please rem remember this. Okay. And then recent event, I don't cover, okay? The Chinese wild attempt in May, okay? Or the second Thomas, we we've discussed a lot. And James showed that harassed Malaysia. We also discussed, please forget about that. Okay, this is really what happened. And, but one thing we overlooked was the Johnson South and Scarborough, Scarborough Shoal. Okay, we know that, but why do I say we overlooked? This is the point. Okay. Johnson South used to be under this Vietnamese control. And 1988 skirmish, this is the island where China fought against Vietnamese and seized the island, or actually the reef. And just last, end of last year, Filipino government released the news that reclamation of the Johnson South Island is ongoing. Okay. So
So please take some time and think about the real meaning. Okay. In the southern part, as I mentioned, I'm repeatedly mentioning the China exercises no over practical control over the larger island. In the northern part, parcels, the story is different. There is larger or largest Hainan Island and Udi Island, famous Udi Island, under the Chinese control. Very good for the strategic use. And southern part, okay, just the Johnson Reef under Chinese control, and Scalval Law show that China started exercising the practical control from the 2012. Okay. So this is the Woody Island. In the, the parcels, there are 2,500 meters runway and huge area, good for the military use. Okay. This is the northern part. And the Johnson South location is there. This is the, the, the tiny leaf, not tiny, 4.5 kilometers north to south, two kilometers east to west, large. And this is what happened, you know that. I'll skip. And this is the pic, okay. Pretty weak, but you see some red line on the, the, the right picture, right? That's the, the potential area for the, the recl reclamation of China. If this is completed, this is the Chinese the co conceptual art but this is the, the, the island after completion of the reclam reclamation. There will be another 2,500 meter long runway with parallel taxiway and several port facilities. Okay. This is the Johnson Island. Please, please think about the position. That, that's in the middle of the spread trees where China has no control. Then, why China took the Scarborough Shoal in 2012? What was the real reason? Is it for the, the, the seabed resources? No, sea is too deep, 4,000 meters. For fishery resources, not so. The simple adventurism to expand its territory, no. Location will be the key, okay? And the size of the shoal is the key, okay? Northwest to southeast, about 15 kilometers. And the yellow part is you know, the, the, my concept. If I were the Beijing planner, I will landfill that area and construct the three kilometers runway with the deep waters, 10 to 20 meters depth. That accommodates all the warships. Okay? And think about the location. That's only several hundred kilometers west of Manila. Or the eastern part of the South China Sea. So okay, this is what I said. So the landfilling after the Johnson South in this island would be the game changer for the overall strategies. Okay? And, so, and this is my last picture, but yeah. Think about the distance. Okay? Sanya to Udi Island, 700 kilometers. Woody Island to Scarborough Shoal, 650. Johnson South, 900. This means if China uses those three islands as a stepping stone, China will be able to exercise its military control, strategic control, and economic control in this South China Sea. This is my estimate. And China is already doing the reclamation in Johnson South. And if this is successful, China will surely go to the Scabolo. This is the real reason of the Chinese strong appetite for the Scabolo. This is the stra stra strategic meaning or simple sailor's thought. But I think this is convincing. <laughs> and what should we, should we do? We should stop. The, there are many things, but I, I'd, I'd like to emphasize only one thing. This is the huge destruction of the nature, great nature. Okay, this will kill. The treasure of the, the human being, the coral reef, by dredging and by landfilling. Do we overlook? Perhaps not. What the Greenpeace is doing, they do nothing. We are ready. Thanks.
Thank you very much, uh, Vice Admiral Koda. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Charmaine Misa, Misa Lucha, uh, who is uh, Assistant Professor in International Studies Department at DeSalle University in the Philippines. She's currently a visiting research fellow at the Osaka School of International Public Policy in Osaka, Japan. Dr. Lucha. Thank you very much and good morning to everybody. I'm very honored and privileged to be here today and I thank CSIS for inviting me to be part of this annual event. Um, my task, the task that, that has been given to me is to identify Southeast Asian responses to US policy in the South China Sea. What I do is that I put the situation into context and argue that our responses and therefore the future trajectories of the dispute are based on particular ways of understanding regional and international dynamics. As a consequence, focus is placed on great power politics at the expense of the small states of Southeast Asia. Indeed, in, in most of the uh, literature, Southeast Asia is seen simply as an adjunct to great power calculations or just the site of a likely confrontation. In this case, Southeast Asian views become nothing more but knee-jerk reactions to policies of extra-regional actors. Against this backdrop, I identify two things that are required for Southeast Asia to play a more active role in improving regional dynamics. First, we need to acknowledge that current projections, while valid, rely on assumptions that are biased towards the interactions of the United States and China. Without the active involvement of Southeast Asia, existing policies and conflict management strategies will be less effective. Second, we also need to acknowledge that the engagement policies that are in place today need adjustment. The motivations for engagement need to shift from protecting strict strategic interests, such as promoting sovereignty over islands, to protecting the global commons such as ensuring the sustainability of the ecology and marine biosphere. In line with this, the analysis that I present here proceeds as follows. I present two scenarios that are based on current understandings of the South China Sea issue. And second, I, pre I present an alternative scenario, which is centered on a more active Southeast Asian role. So the first scenario uh, revolves around the idea that increased tensions also means a reduction of security. Um, in academia, this is a basic formula for the security dilemma, where the drive to security generates insecurity from other states due to uncertainty about others' motivations and the availability of imperfect information. This engenders mistrust and misperception, and um, in line with this logic, we seem to see that China and Southeast Asia are seeking to maximize their security, and in a situation where motivations are unclear, each side takes measures that are misperceived as offensive and that, ironically, generate insecurity. The mitigation of the security dilemma depends on an outside arbiter, in this case, the United States. The region supports US, um, uh, US commitment, um, and this is seen in a very positive light. It, after all, the presence of the US, after all, shifts the balance of power in the region. But at the same time, we also realize that this is costly and unsustainable. The cyclical nature of the action-reaction spiral necessitates extensive and prolonged commitments by outside powers to ensure regional security. This can prove to be too heavy a burden and can lead to overstretch. The second scenario that I present centers on the idea that the more powers there are, the more likely conflict will occur. And those of us in academia will realize that this is the embodiment or the epitome of the power transition theory, where calculations are made about the existence of a hegemon and a dissatisfied rising power that challenges the status quo. China's growth is seen as an indicator of how it will soon surpass the US. The mitigation of the effects of power transition include the following options, balancing, containment, or engagement, which is my focus here. The objectives of engagement include uh, discovering preferences of the targeted state, 
shaping those preferences in certain directions, and creating international institutions that can benefit the parties involved. There are reasons, however, why um, the current engagement policies we have towards China are less than optimal. The first reason is that we often see engagement as being an end in itself. Moreover, we also see engagement, more often than not, as a one-way street. We seem to assume that the targeted state, in this case China, is unaware of the behavior modification strategies aimed against it. In sum, the two scenarios that I presented here are generalized versions of current understandings about China's role in the South China Sea dispute. Clearly, Southeast, Southeast Asia needs to figure more prominently and be an active stakeholder in the maintenance of, re, of the regional security architecture. This therefore calls for an alternative scenario. So the alternative scenario that I, I, I put forth is by no means radical. It builds on what are currently in place. Um, I only mean to draw attention um, and shift attention, I mean, to the motives behind engagement instead of focusing strictly on um, strategic gains. This modified variant of socialization is oftentimes referred to as communicative or complex engagement. This revolves around the idea that behavior modification is a two-way process, not necessarily one way. Um, recognizing this possibility allows for a more central role for Southeast Asia. Now the question is, how do we do this? We can do this by first identifying the current sentiments of Southeast Asia. For the Philippines, we welcome the U.S. rebalance, um, but we hope to make the relationship with our treaty ally less one-sided. The currently signed enhanced uh, EDCA is seen as a progress, a step in the right direction, um, because this features the development of the Philippines' minimum credible defense posture. Vietnam hopes to transform its relationship with the U.S. to a strategic partnership instead of only a comprehensive partnership. Malaysia and Brunei are quieter claimants in the dispute as they are more reluctant to draw attention to their own disputes. Singapore, Indonesia, and Thailand are described as anxious claimants as they are all dependent on the flow of shipping through the Malacca Straits. Cambodia, Myanmar, and Laos are seen to be disinterested parties, primarily because they have no direct claims, but also they are seen as they are very close Chinese allies. ASEAN as an organization wants the U.S. involved primarily as a balancer. So in this sense, the U.S. is seen as in, a, in a positive light across the region. But, and this is the caveat, extensive, prolonged, and indefinite commitment on the part of the U.S. is not in the best interest of any of the parties. Also, the involvement of non-claimant extra-regional actors endangers the fragile stability in the region. Also, this defeats the empowerment of small states to manage regional powers and crises. So it is therefore imperative to infuse agency to Southeast Asia. A proactive region is needed. This is achievable by deepening the links, Southeast Asian links, with each other, increasing interoperability, and being more involved in multilateral forums. This is the heart of communicative engagement. It generates common interpretations and mutual expectations, and, it, and is at bottom really um, an exercise in confidence building. And I argue in my paper that forums like this help a lot in building relationships. So in conclusion, um, there is value in re-examining our current understandings about the South China Sea. A careful review of the foundations of states' policies reveals that the ways in which we address the crisis are biased towards the continued role of the U.S. in the region. This is costly and impractical. Hence, an alternative solution lies in, mo in a more active role by Southeast Asia. This can be achieved by modifying pre-existing policies from strategic or self-interested engagement to communicative or complex engagement. The adjusted variant values dialogue and, con and confidence-building measures more than short-term bargains. In this regard, forums such as this are critical to the creation and fostering of relationships where the exchange of ideas 
outside and beyond the walls of the states of states can flourish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Misalucha. Uh, so we have a few minutes for, for questions. Uh, so please raise your hand, wait for a mic. You know the drill, get and identify yourself. Please, Andre. Thank you. Uh, I'm Andre Sauvageau, and I am um, the uh, chief representative in Vietnam for the Interstate Traveler Company, businessman, in other words. <laughs> but um, wonderful discussion. I'm very, I guess my question is really directed to Dr. Uh, Chulam uh, to better answer my question, and that is this. Um, after a couple of days of really sophisticated discussion by lawyers, and, and it's been brought out that China uh, has a great sophistication and understanding of, uh, of some international law, such as um, the flexibility that China showed in, um, in entering the World Trade Organization. So my question is, why doesn't China display a similar flexibility and sophistication in the South China Sea? And in, until I hear your answer, sir, my own con uh, inductive uh, my leap, would, uh, my conclusion would be that actually Admiral Cota actually gave the answer when he described this, uh, the game changer in just simply the physical geopolitical power that China can exert over other countries. And so that's the reason that I can conclude. But what is the, your answer, sir? Thank you for the question. Uh, I think the, most of the Chinese do not trust the international law, including UNC Convention, can be helpful to resolve the disputes. It's because the convention which the Chinese believe led to those disputes, territory or territory borders, formed in hundreds and thousands of years in history. They were not formed by law, by treaty, by contracts, by agreement in modern time. So today's law might not be good to apply the issues that are developed long time in the past. Uh, so that is the, the general view that uh, this law might not be helpful uh, because m most of the territory disputes formed and involved by history, not by treaties, by agreement, by contract in the past, even within country, between villages. Uh, so that is the fact. Uh, and the, you mentioned about the animal colors, uh, the, the, the map, and the mentioned that like those uh, locations that like emphasize. So you mentioned I have to react to. I, I think it's a full of imagination whether it's going to be true to China uh, or not, I think nobody can, be, uh, can predict. But uh, as uh, scientific research, we should uh, depend on the facts, on empirical. I think the empirical fact that uh, China has been a major power country in Asia for thousand years. But uh, China never controlled, invade most of the part of Asia. There's only one country, it's your country, in which the control most of the power is. Thank you. Please, back there. Hi, I'm Ian Henry from the Australian National University. Uh, Bonnie, you mentioned that the US has used PA Poseidon aircraft uh, to assist the Philippines. I'm just wondering if you can expand upon that a little bit more. I don't think that's ever been publicly confirmed. And also for the panel, is there a sense that perhaps uh, Japan has drawn any conclusions from the US response to the Scarborough Shoal? Some might characterize it as a fairly tepid response in 2012. And is there a sense perhaps in the Philippines that they're being treated differently under their alliance to Japan is, where Japan's received strong statements of support affirming that disputed territories fall under Article 5 of the US-Japan Mutual Defense Treaty? Thank you. I don't know if there have been um, any uh, 
confirmations uh, by the U.S. of its operations, but we have certainly seen many news reports and, in fact, photographs. Um, I know I've seen some photographs in, uh, taken by Vietnamese media of U.S. surveillance aircraft that have been flying uh, over the rig. Uh, and also in the case of 2nd Thomas Shoal, I've talked with um, Chinese foreign ministry officials who have told me that U.S. assets um, are being deployed in these, in these instances. Um, so I, I don't, if, to the best of my knowledge, there's been no um, uh, Navy assets that have been uh, deployed close. I would think that they would be fairly far over the horizon, but I would guess that they are there uh, as well. Does anybody else want to uh, answer um, his second part of his question, how, what Japan might have concluded from the U.S. response to Scarborough Shoal? You know, the yeah, 2012, still, you know, the Japan and U.S. didn't have enough information about the, to estimate the Chinese intent. You know, the, just that, the first time, at least the, based on the open sources, you know, the, the reclamation of the island was well known in late last year. So then that gave some hint about Chinese intent on Scarborough share. So in this context, perhaps the, both US and Japan lost the first opportunity to really oppose the Chinese intent or wild attempt over the Scarborough show too late. But the, the key question is how well should we regain our naval advantage over the Chinese wild attempt in this area? Because this is once lost show with the great potential of strategic use. So if we keep the, the, or on accepting, practically ac accepting the Chinese control over the Scarborough show, the situation will get worsened and worsened for Japan and US side. So th there is the, the huge area for both in Japan jointly de de develop the new strategy, how to cope with this, you know, the, the Chinese attempt. And this is what I think we need at the urgent level. Thank you. Richard? Richard. Thank you. Uh, I'm Richard Cronin. I direct the Southeast Asia program at the Stimson Center. Uh, I have a question primarily for Dr. Nisalucha, uh, but also secondarily for, for Bonnie uh, Glazer, and that is that um, uh, many of us uh, in the room, and uh, certainly us policymakers and others, are very frustrated that the Senate has never ratified um, UNCLOS. And uh, it's a real sore point, and it's an advantage, obviously, for China in any debate to point that out. Um, and so my question is really about, I know that, uh, that you were trying, Dr. Misalucci, you were trying to focus on what ASEAN should do with itself, but I'm still wondering whether um, uh, it couldn't be effective for ASEAN embassies and, and governments to, to, if you will, lobby with the United, government, United States, and particularly with the Senate, uh, on, on, on ratification or, uh, of the of UNCLOS. And, because it's something, you know, it's not neither right nor smart for the Obama administration to be going to the Senate and saying to a relative handful of, of, of senators who, on the conservative Republican side who uh, oppose this uh, on, on grounds of their feelings about the United Nations, et cetera. Uh, it wouldn't be smart or, I think, right for the Obama administration to, to be emphasizing the China factor as a reason for that ratification. But the other countries in the region do uh, subscribe to the same ideas of, um, uh, share the same uh, ideas about international law and uh, international norms. And so I wonder uh, how effective that might be. Uh, thank you. you go first. Okay, thank you for that question. And I think, I personally think that that's a great idea. Um, but 
we should also consider that um, the ASEAN states are still thinking as individual states, not as a monolithic entity. And that, I think, is one hurdle um, for, for, for the region. As, as long as they still keep on thinking um, as individual states rather than as a region, um, there won't be any, um, any unified lobby um, to convince the United States to ratify UNCLOS. I would just add that you know it was heartening to hear early on in the Obama administration when Secretary Clinton said that she was going to get this done, and, and now, of course, President Obama said it in the West Point speech, but I don't see any strategy to really get this done in Congress either, um, as uh, I think Mr. Reichler talked about. Uh, but nevertheless, I do think that we need to recognize that even though it is important for the United States to rat ratify UNCLOSE, that the United States nevertheless abides by it. And so I believe that even if we ratified it today, that U.S. behavior would in no way change. Uh, and so the U.S. Um, activities, the way that we um, conduct our policy is very much consistent with the, US con with the U.N. Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, I regret that our, our time is up for this panel. Um, I know there's a lot of questions on the floor. I feel really bad about that. But uh, please join me in thanking the panelists.